it's good that you're that you're flexible. It makes you even more of a delight to work with. Oh, really? It was a delight to work with me. I have to steal that quote. I have to steal that quote and put it in my profile on ACX. Delight to work with, says Lorian. No, no, that's just virtual. You know, I have not met you in person, so virtually, yes. Yes, virtually. I'm I'm virtually delightful. Yeah, okay. Plainfield was a small, flat, middle-of-nowhere place with long, wide, empty roads, perpetually shadowed beneath dark clouds and surrounded by cornfields. It rained a lot. Thunderstorms every day, with lightning and tornadoes. And there was a lonesome, forlorn feeling that only folks passing through seemed to notice. And when the folks passing through drove on, the bad feeling was forgotten, like a nightmare soon after waking. And that middle-of-nowhere town, what was it called again, was forgotten too. How are you, Laurie? You okay? Doing well, yeah. It's nice to meet you. And you too, after working so hard on this amazing book, which of course we're going to talk about because it's now an audio book and I was privileged to be chosen to be the narrator for your audio book. So uh, The Strange Abduction of Freddy Heddy Hardcrumble, part one. Okay, let's get some stuff out of the way. Let's, out, I don't mean out of the way. Let's, let's go deeper into you. You're in Englewood, Colorado. Yeah. I was. I'm in Littleton now, which is just a few miles south of Englewood. Okay, so are they suburbs of Denver? Yeah, yeah. I'm about maybe like a 25 minute drive from downtown Denver. Okay. So I'm just south of Denver. Mm-hmm. I've been to Denver. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, I for years I was I was in radio, and I used to go to a thing called the Morning Show Boot Camp, which is where Morning shows from all over, mostly all over America, uh, spend a weekend in a hotel and steal each other's ideas and, you know, there's seminars on different things and, uh, and what have you. And uh, Denver has a particular memory for me um, at the time, and it was a bad idea, I was uh, committing stand-up comedy in the UK. Uh, and failing, I might add. <laughs> it was not pretty. And and for some reason, I decided, oh, when I'm in Denver at the morning show boot camp, I'll do it there too. And so there was this open mic night in a bar. I can't remember the name of it, but it was on a, a street called Broadway, a long, long, wide street, oh, yeah. obviously Broadway. And the name of the bar was the number, it was the address. So it was like 261 Broadway or something was the name of the bar. It was right next to a gun shop, which was a bit of a worry. Um, and anyway, I attempted it there and, uh, it, it would ju- it, it, it was horrible. <laughs> uh, um, to say I died is probably an understatement. Uh, it was not good. And the place was not good either. The place was like a haircut museum. There were actual mullets in there. Um, it was uh, anyway, uh, it didn't work out, but I was with a guy called Gene from, a morning show in South Carolina, Gene and Julie, husband and wife coach. And I came off stage and I said, what do you think we should do now? And he said, run. <laughs> and we ran out of the place, ran out into Broadway and hailed a cab back to the hotel. Yeah, it was. Uh, and my mistake was this was in about 2008. And, and I, I opened or was near the beginning of the set. I opened with this joke. Uh, and that was, uh, I said, you know, in this hotel, and I named the hotel, I forget which one it was, one of the big ones, I said, is, is all the top morning shows from the radio or from all over America? I said, so, you know, one carefully placed bomb and you could change the face of morning radio in this country forever. And um, then I started, and it didn't go well. And, and, you know, so we're only like, you know, seven years after 9-11 and I'm like, Oh, okay. So we're uncomfortable with terrorism jokes. Okay. Well, I grew up with it. We had the IRA in Britain and, you know, you know, we even celebrate a, a terrorist called Guy Fawkes who tried to blow up Parliament. We have a festival every year. On a, and the more I went, the deeper hole I dug. And it, uh, no, it wasn't pretty. 
wasn't pretty at all. That's unfortunate. So I've got an unfortunate memory of Denver. Um, but anyway, but you're originally from Illinois. I am, yeah, about an hour south of Chicago. Okay, where would that be? All right. I'm not bragging again, but I've been to Chicago and I drove to Chicago from Memphis up uh, oh, yeah. old Route 66, and then I, and then I, then it went into anyway. But we went through some lovely places in. We stayed in Perryvale, Illinois. I had a tiny little population. Springfield, Illinois. We're about Springfield. south south of Chicago. Uh, I was in Plainfield, which is kind of near Joliet. But I is it the same grew- playing field in the book as is in the book? Well, it might be. It's got to be, I'd, right? I have to read it again. <laughs> but I, mean, I, uh, I had no idea it was a real place. Yeah, lots of plains, lots of fields. Um, I started in Bolingbrook, Illinois, and we moved when I was about eleven to Plainfield. Yeah. It was yeah. right near Joliet, where the uh, Joliet where the prison is. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. we went past the prison. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a couple of famous—I don't know if famous is the best word—but I think um, a couple of serial killers were there. I think John Wayne Gacy yeah. was held there or executed there. Isn't it the one at the beginning of the Blues Brothers movie that John Belushi yeah. comes out of too, and Jan Danakro p- picks him up in the police car? Yeah, yeah. That's it's kind Joliet. of a famous little spot. Yep, in that same one. Uh-huh. So why did you move from Illinois to Colorado? Uh, well, I came out when I was 18 and I went to the Colorado Film School. Yes. So that was kind of a big draw. But I actually, before I moved, I was also working in radio at the time. Which station? Well, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was uh, 100.7 WRXQ, which was yeah. a class classic rock station and then i also did the country station yeah which was was 98.3 wccq and what did you do well i started off as an intern i was in love with radio i was obsessed when i was 12 13 years old i would wake up on saturdays at 3 30 in the morning to listen i guess kind of stalk my favorite djs so I was calling in so much, they kind of knew me when I'd call and would give me some free stuff. And they said, you know, hey, when you're 15, if you want to do an internship, get in touch with with us then, which was a couple years away. So I did. And they ended up bringing me on board as an intern. So I did things in the beginning, like filing paperwork with the sales department, coffee, uh, just, you know, things like that. And then slowly progressed to being in the studio and then helping with the morning show. And then when I was 18, uh, they, so it'd been about three years of being an unpaid intern. When I was 18, they hired me as a board operator. Great. Great. And classic yeah. rock. That's a nice format to be on too. It was fun. It was. Yeah, it was great. You know, in the beginning I, I didn't like country. I was not, you know, I was a teenager, so I like top forties and then I grew to like classic rock as well. But I kind of switched over to the country station and was going yeah. back and forth and you know, you'd be, you're in the studio and you hear the country songs and for a while I didn't really pay much attention to them. And then eventually in the studio, I was kind of bopping along. And then before you knew it, I was like, Yee-haw! the great thing. I mean, I think w- when I was still going, cause I used to go to the U S every year to this morning show boot camp. it moved around to different cities. And I think, Country was the number one music format at the time in the early 2000s. Country was the big format to be on. Yeah. It was, yeah. So this was probably around 2003 to 2005. Yeah. So, yeah. Country yeah. was a big, uh, country used to get big numbers. I think in certain cities, the Spanish stations did better, but as an English speaking music format, country used to be the one. And, uh, and I think it's because it's just, so american i think people relate to it more or they you know i lived in australia for a while and australia has a a similar feeling about their own australians have a similar feeling about their own country that i think americans have i mean australians most australians live in cities but their identity is with the bush and and i think the same may be true of america that most americans live in cities but they're you know they love the 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 cowboy in them you know they they i i get that feeling you know and so i i kind of because we don't really have we i think we've got like two country music stations in the uk for the whole country because uh 
it's not a big format here at all. Uh, it's mostly pop music here. And uh, it, it's hard to understand why, why country is such a big format in America, but I think it's very, just because it's very, very American. It's very, very American, yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah. good, good, good couple of formats you worked in there. Though classic rock and then country, they're biggies. Yeah, a couple of good ones. I think though, because I was just a kid, you know, starting out as teenagers, our our main thing was the top forties. Yeah. So before, yeah, before a hundred dot seven, um, the classic rock station, it was a top forty station that everybody in middle school, high school was in love with. Yeah. So uh, country, country's kind of hit or miss with a lot of people, I'd say. That, you oh, know, really? there is a, yeah, there's a lot of people that um, not so much with the country. And I, I used yeah. to be that one, but now I appreciate just about all music. Yeah. So you gave up this burgeoning radio career, this thing you were obsessed with. You were a fangirl of radio, and then you go to Denver to study film. And how did that work out? That was the Colorado Film School. It was, yeah. It was great. It was a great program. Um, I missed radio a lot though. So I ended up getting another internship out here. This you one did? was with, a, yeah, it was with a news station, Yeah, which was different. Um, it was fun. It wasn't as fun. You know, we did things back in Illinois, back in the day, like we had a pizza for you Tuesdays. So we yes. would take the bus out, pick up a whole bunch of pizzas that were donated and then go to a parking lot and broadcast live. And yeah, that was a lot of fun. You know, radio is so different now oh it's rubbish it's so it, it does it there's no they've sucked all the fun out of it yeah, yeah. yeah. and i i miss it and i had kind of thought of going getting back into it but i guess now really everyone's podcasting i don't know that radio is ever going to be like it was before no um, i think i think it's had its day um yeah i i i did 29 years full-time mostly morning shows in radio here and in australia and uh just before the pandemic i was a program director of a radio station in london and they fired me just before the pandemic and uh i couldn't even get anyone to interview me during the pandemic so i started doing audiobooks from home and i love it love it i couldn't go back to radio now and deal with the the sales department and their program directors and the ratings and the pressure and whatever. Now it's just between me and the author of the book I'm working on and we work together until we put out something that the author's happy with and uh, and that's it and then move on to the next book and it's just working with you was so much fun because you were, you were actually, uh, you knew exactly what you wanted and if I didn't deliver that line right, you went, no, I did that one again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was good. It was good to work with someone who knew exactly what they wanted. You know, sometimes I'll work with authors, and everybody's different. If, if somebody wants to work a different way, and I'll do yeah. something, and I'll go, and they, and I, you know, they'll say, "Oh yeah, it's really good. I like it." And I think, well, I wonder if they really do. But with you, I knew <laughs> if it if it if it wasn't right, you'd say there there was one, wasn't there, where there was an accent. Was there a Cajun accent in uh, in one of the characters? Uh -huh. And I pronounced a, uh, pronounced a word, one word that wasn't <laughs> quite within the accent. And, uh, and you picked me up and said, no, it should sound more like this. Was it the word yes? And I did it more, um, I forget oh. what it was now. Yeah. I'm trying to write, it was, it was, I think it was first. And first, it, which is, it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, Cajun is like, um, it's kind of spelled F-U-S-C, so foist, because sort of. Yeah. Yeah, well. yeah, and you and you made me do it again. <laughs> it's, it's a Julie, yeah, Julie says to me, she says, "How's it going with that book?" I said, "Oh, it's great." I said, "I just had to go in and change a word." She went, "Really, really, a word?" I said, "Yeah, it was important. This word." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, now, yeah. One, I, I, one, I put a warning though in the audition. I, I oh, did, you uh, did? No, you did. Uh, I think I think yours was because um, often when when the auditions come up on ACX when I audition for them. Often I think like, you know, there might be, I think there's supposed to be three pages, but how many, how big are the words on a page? Uh, often I will go like, I'll, I'll just do the audition. And when I think I've done enough, I'll put it in. But yours basically said, unless you're prepared to do the whole audition, <laughs> don't bother. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 You, and I forget how many pages it was, but you made, you made me go right to the end. And I think even in the audition, I got a couple of things wrong. 
and you picked them out and said like, well, you know, if you're going to do this, you better get these right. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah. yeah. No, but that that's good. And uh, the thing I learned about you when, when I had a look on Amazon at your profile on there, and it says you know you you were you studied writing and directing at the Colorado Film School. You won awards uh, in the independent film community for your short films. But I also found out you're legally blind. Yes, that is true. Yeah. Well, that makes total sense working in radio. <laughs> but um, but in film, I mean, how much can you how much can you see? Yeah, film was a little more difficult, um, but you have people to do things for you. Mm -hmm. So one thing was trying to make sure things were in focus, um, which you leave that up to your cinematographer. You know, yeah. I I could I would tell him the kind of shot I want. You know, if I want it, uh, see if I want it, you know, straight on or the person to the side or this side. So I could tell that much, but if it was in focus or not, or with lighting, I could kind of tell the general idea of what the lighting looked like. But for little nitpicky things, I would sort of tell my cinematographer the feeling I'm going for, for the scene. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that'd probably be after a while, if you're working with the same person, there'd be a bit of shorthand there. You'd be able to say, I want this kind of vibe or that kind of thing. You'd have to trust them though. Yeah. 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 And I worked with the same person a few times. He's a really good right. guy. Good yeah. friend of mine. Oh, that was, I found that, I found that really interesting. Wow. And so has your eyesight always been a, an issue or did, did, did it, did something happen? I don't want I don't want to pry too much. And I don't know what the politically collect, correct way to ask that question is. So if you think I'm being rude, just tell me to mind my own business. I, I am immediately offended. So <laughs> Okay. I can tell. Yeah. No, I I woke up one morning and I rubbed my eyes too hard and then I just, you know, from there it was downhill. You rode your no, eyes too hard what? <laughs> no, I was born with uh with a genetic retinal disease. Okay. Uh, which is degenerative. And then right. with that, um, I had cataracts, so I had cataract surgery. Uh, and then I have congenital nystagmus, which is the shaking. And with that, I have oscillopathy, which is where everything you see shakes. So there's a whole party going on. Okay. And so is it stabilized now? Is, if you, is the way it is now the way it'll stay? Not necessarily. The doctor said to be optimistic that it might, but there are some people with the retinal disease that I have who end up with just light perception. Um, wow. So like now I read a lot. I'm always listening to audiobooks or reading. So I primarily yeah. read large print books, but right. there are some people with eye disease who they get to a point where they, they just see light. So that must be good. The must be good these days with an ebook because with an ebook you can choose the size of the font, which you can't obviously in a, in a paper book. You know, I'm not the biggest fan of ebooks. I, I like paper. I think just working on a computer, I just like being off of a screen. Um, right. I know everybody says I should get an ebook, but I, I like having paper books. Okay. All right. So, what were you reading as a kid? What was inspiring you? Oh, as a kid, a little kid. Um, yeah. What What first but, books really got you into reading? Got you hooked? Well, that's kind of difficult to say. So as a little kid, I remember reading Goosebumps. Yeah, okay. I think it was called Animorphs, where the people can turn into animals. Right. Uh, and I remember reading something about a mouse. But then it got to the point where I wasn't really able to... A kid's book about a mouse. You haven't really narrowed it down, Larry. But yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was very good, though, I remember. Um, but then uh, as you get older the font isn't as big. So I recall being in middle school and I think during a break, we were supposed to sit and read for 40 minutes. And I remember it was Dracula, which is standard print. Mm -hmm. And I just spent 40 minutes just trying to read one of the pages and I just couldn't. I just, you know, trying to read if it was the, and nobody really knew the extent of my vision loss. So I didn't really understand what was going on. I just thought I'm kind of different and pe I could see other kids turning pages and I'm still on the same page. So it was probably, I think, in high school when I got some actual large print books. And in that day, the books were like three feet tall. Wow. So they, they don't have those anymore, but we got these 
they, I think they were delivered by a low vision teacher that I had. So I got these books and in the, for the class assignment, we just had to pick one and read it. But I was so excited to finally be able to read that I just read them all, which I think was like five books. So right. it was, it was Do you know kind what of kind of stuff that was? Oh, the book that I read? Yeah. Uh, one of them was about, um, it's a true story about the Ebola virus. Okay. And uh, about someone, it follows a few people who had the Ebola virus. Uh, it was very graphic, um, but it was really well written. Because um, what I'm then, looking for is I'm trying to find out where what attracted you to, to write the book and what the inspiration was for the strange abduction of Freddy Hedy Hardcrumble. Because this is quite, it's quite a, a dark book. It's, And in some ways it's quite a sad book because... Freddie, she, she's not one of life's winners. That doesn't mean she's not strong and doesn't have, you know, a determined character and a will to want something better for her life, but she's ended up in a pretty rubbish place in her life before she gets abducted. I'm just, I'm just wondering where the, the inspiration for all that came from. She has, but what's interesting is I think there's a lot of people out there that are like that because to her, she's pretty content, just like most everybody in the town. It's kind of from what she came from to what she has now, this is all right for her life to be this way until she dies. She doesn't really want anything better for herself and she doesn't know. All she knows is kind of the big city is sort of symbolic for all the other things that are out in the world. So she mm-hmm. knows of it, but she's never mm-hmm. seen it. She's never been there. And kind of the kidnapping sort of could be seen as a blessing in disguise because otherwise maybe she would have never left that town. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the book starts and it threads through because you, you, you change perspective because it starts with her, uh, she's a prisoner. And then you get start getting you're filling in the details of her backstory and of her life up until that point, but you focus in on the plastic fake food that she's discovered and she's realizing that it is plastic even though she's starving. Why why did you use that as a device? Because it is quite clever. It works really well. What why, what was the inspiration behind that? I don't know if I can answer that. That's a good question. Um, I guess the only answer it, I it, it, what it does is it when you when you read it when I read it, it helped me realize just how, you know, desperate a situation she was in that she would try to eat plastic food when it was clearly plastic. But she's thinking, well, maybe maybe it's just a cover or maybe, you know she's all she's got that hope. So it 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 yeah. did so it, as a device it worked really well to show that there was that hope there even though it was a delusional hope but also that the desperation of the situation she was in. I was just wondering if there was something that, that pointed you to that. Well, her character kind of develops from the beginning of looking at the plastic and her situation, and she's very neat with, any, with everything from the painting to rolling up the cereal boxes, but she kind of changes, one, from desperation, but then also her mind might be going just a little bit from the captivity and yeah. lack of food. So she sort yeah. of goes to a place that she's never been and her brain has to work in a way that it probably never would have if this hadn't happened to her. Yeah, because her life was pretty regimented, wasn't it? She knew exactly when her shift was, what to expect. And, you know, she was, she's... Uh, yeah, then she ends up in the bar from from the waitressing, and then there's an incident there. So you get to see, yeah. It, it, is there is there any of you in Freddy? Of course not. Absolutely not. I'm just. Well, where does she where does she come from then? I don't know. I, I guess probably I'm in every character. Maybe not constantly, <laughs> but yeah. I would imagine so. Um, Do you think so that you could have ended up like Freddy if you'd have stayed in Plainville? No, things were going really well. I was working okay. in radio. Pretty right, good. okay. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. But did you know people in Plainville like Freddie then? No. No. Where's she come from, Laurie? <laughs> I'll have to check in on that and probably get back to you. Okay. 
Okay, because she is a she is an interesting character, and I know by the end of the book, I'm like, what now? What happens now? You 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 make well, you made me care so much about her and some of the other lesser characters as well, but her mainly is like the, there was um, there was a I felt a, a deep caring for her by the end of the book. Can you tell us? Can you give us a clue to where this story will eventually go, or is that a little bit too much? I don't want well, to spoil glad- anything. No, not at all. I'm glad to hear you say that because there are two more parts. So, um, yeah. the second part is probably about sixty-five percent done. Right. Uh, the, the third part isn't even. Um, that's. I'll probably know more when I get the second part done. But uh, do you to, know to where the th- where the three are going? Do you have you got it kind of mapped out in your mind? It's still a work in progress. Okay. I, uh, I probably think about it all throughout the day, along with the other projects. Yeah. Uh, but I I'm working on other things, so I float between the second part. I have the name. It's the part two is Orlo, which mm-hmm. let's see detective. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I rotate between that the second part of Freddy and then there's a novel that I'm working on um, and then another short story and another novel. So I'm, I'm always sort of rotating between things. So when you say you've got other projects on, are they all writing projects? Are you doing other stuff as well? Uh, writing? Yep. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah. Everything is writing. I do a little bit of video stuff. Um, and then I compete in writing competitions, just like short stories and things like that. So I'm always submitting to this or that. I saw a couple of YouTube videos you'd done, and uh, uh, there's a dog in there that features pretty prominently. You're very, very close to the dog. Oh, yes, yeah. Bindi. What's the, so that's who Bindi is, because that, that was yeah. going to be one of my... my it's Because the book starts by saying for Bindi, and Bindi yeah. is the dog. Yeah, she's actually... She's right down here right now. But too high up to get to... She, she weighs 80 pounds, otherwise I'd hold her up. So how important is she then? Oh, she's very important. Yeah. Actually, yeah. She knows I'm talking about her. Hi, baby. And what, what breed is she? Let me see. Hold on one second. Okay. <laughs> hey, Bendy. Hello, sweetheart. Oh, you're beautiful. Look at you. Hello, Bendy. Oh, what a beautiful dog. Oh, she's lovely. So how long has she been part of your life? Uh, She just turned seven in April. So I've had her since she was about nine weeks old. Yeah. She's about this big. (laughs) And what is she? Uh, Boxer lab mix, kind of a mix. Sort of paper. Yeah. yeah, we got we got a dog about three months ago. First dog we ever had, um, Rafa, and uh, we don't know what he is. He came from Spain. He was from rescued from Spain from well the Canary Islands, part of Spain, but it's off the coast of North Africa. So he's got an English winter to get through yet. And oh, yeah. uh, we had him about three months, and he's completely changed our lives. But we've no idea what he is. He he looks like. He looks like he's got Beagle in there or some kind of foxhound, but I'm sure there's Terrier in there too because he does like, if he sees rabbits or squirrels, he's, uh, he's off. And uh, oh, they're just uh, they're just wonderful companions, aren't they? So special. Yeah, she's great. So the, which, uh, which video with Bindi in it did you see? It was the one where you were camping. You were, you were like climbing mountains and there's a lot of still pictures in there as well. You're in a tent. It starts, it starts with the sound of the rain on the canvas. Yeah. And then the credits, and then, and then, and then I think we see Bendy pretty early on. Then in the in the video, yeah. Yeah, that was just a weekend before last. Oh, was it? Oh well, I got the. La- oh, I'm right up to date. I'm I'm not stalking you <laughs> yeah. or anything, but I just thought like when it said you know award winning filmmaker, I thought oh I'll see if there's anything on YouTube. <laughs> well, did you right. happen to look at the other videos? No, no, just that was that was the main one I had a look at. Which one would you recommend? Well, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, I say you started off pretty pretty good. Um, yeah. I have a rap video on there. That- oh, oh, no, I did see that. I did see that one. Yeah. Yes. You're a good rapper. I try. Yeah, no, that no, I did see that one. That's a nice short one. Yeah, I did have a yeah, look at that this morning. 
Yeah, most of the videos are fairly short. So, but yeah, I, I win a couple awards, but that's you know in the independent film community. So nothing, yeah. uh, nothing too yeah. major. No, that was a while ago. So look at you! You're doing all this stuff, and uh, and and you got me to narrate the strange abduction of Freddy Heddy Hardcrumble. Have you had audio books done before from your work? Yes, um, I have. My first novel. Yes. Which was. What's it called? Uh, Dear Aunt Catherine. Dear Aunt Catherine, I'll put a link to that in the description. Obviously, I'll put a link to The Strange Abduction of Freddie Heddy Harkrummel, but I'll, I'll put a link to that one in there as well on Amazon. So, you can yeah. watch. so if you're watching this on YouTube right now, you know, get the links and, and download them. So that was your first ever novel. So you turned that into an audio book. Yes. Yeah, she did a great job. The narrator, um, we, we never spoke like this, but she was in New York and she trained as a voice actress at NYU. Yes, and she, wow. She was like, just like you, she was very good, able to do. So I think there's about seven different accents in the novel. Yeah. Um, she followed them very well. Yeah. And then uh, this is a short story. Yes, what's that one called? Birdie Nook. Birdie Nook. I'll put a link to that one too. And yeah. And that one's it's, an audio book as well? It is, yes. Um, it's kind of a monster in the closet type of a scary character study about a girl named Bertie Nook. And who's the narrator on those? Uh, the first one, the novel, is Rachel Music. Yeah. And then uh, Bertie Nook was by A.W. Miller. Yeah. Okay. And he did a really good job as well. Uh, so how do, you, how do you find the whole process then? of? Because to me... Um, I, I, I get overwhelmed at the beginning of the, the awesome responsibilities. Like, this is somebody's work. They've put blood, sweat, and tears, and they've rethought every line, and now they're giving it to me to read it out. Jeez. So how did you find the experience of, of turning your work into audiobooks? It was definitely a learning experience. So Dear Aunt Catherine was the first one, and I kind of learned just posting an audition script how important that is. Yeah. And that you really do need to put a sampling of all the different characters or you might get a narrator and then find out when you need uh, an Australian accent. You know, they sound like they're from South Carolina or something, <laughs> So, which which happened with Dear Aunt Catherine when I first posted the audition script and people started submitting. I kind of went back and added some more diversity yeah. and then also more specific with what accent is going to be needed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was definitely a learning experience, which I took into the next one, which was uh, Birdie Nook, which yeah. I do believe you had auditioned for as well. Oh, really? And I, I've, obviously I failed. I was just no good at that. It was, it was terrible. It was, <laughs> no, no. I'm surprised you even listened to my other one then for Freddie Hey. I listened to every – and I'm, you were great. And honestly, it came down to you, A.W. Miller, and I think one – one other guy and then it was down to you and aw miller who which i ended up going with miller mm -hmm. but it was mm -hmm. yeah it was really difficult to choose between you and the you and the and, other narrator and was aw miller uh, miller are they american i believe he is in the united states we've never spoken aside from email and you know messaging ACX back and forth messages and yeah. yeah yeah that's pretty much it so I, I think he is in the United States, though. Okay, because the thing I tend to do, I mean, I do, I do books in all sorts of accents. I've done them. I recently did well, the whole book as a New Zealander. Um, but what I do with a lot of American ones, if they're written that way, if they're not written from first person, and I did this with yours, is I do the characters in the local American accent, but I do the narration as British just yeah. so just so that the narrator stands just slightly outside the story and i i find that that kind of works well and, and a lot of authors i work with like that and they and a lot of them tell me they never imagined it other any other accent than an american accent for the whole thing but having the narrator as a british because it's i think my british accent is is I think is quite a neutral one. It isn't, it's not a Cockney one, not that, or it isn't, you know, too posh like that. It's, it's, <laughs> I think it's a bit, it's a bit more neutral. So it works well just to, 
tell the story and then have the characters come in as, as their local accents. Did you find that worked for you? Well, you must have done. You paid me. <laughs> right. You would think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I thought that uh, I thought that was brilliant because I like the story being told kind of like the old audiobooks back in the day. I don't know if you remember when they had music and sound effects and it, yes. it was sort of like, yeah. yeah, like you're listening to a movie. Yeah. A radio while, play. Yeah. Yeah. Radio play. While this doesn't have music and sound effects, it has yeah. everything else. Um, yeah, it is kind of the modern way now. Is they just is is it is the the story is just told like a book, like somebody reading you a book these days. Yeah, which I think, you know, I think there is a place for music and sound effects, but I think if you want to, you know, when I was in radio, it was drummed into us, particularly when I was first started in radio school in Australia, that radio is a one to one medium. That people are usually listening to the radio on their own. You don't talk to a group of people. You talk to a single person. So you don't say. Um, uh, c coming up, uh, I'm going to give you all a chance to win some tickets. You go, coming up, I'll give you a chance to win some tickets. You, d you do it one-to-one. -one. And so I think with audiobooks, which are definitely listened to by somebody on their own, it makes it more one-to-one. -one. If you start putting the music and the sound effects in, it makes it more theatrical. So it, you feel like you're... I don't know if I'm making sense here, but I think without the music and the sound effects, when it is down to the narrator's voice only, it does make it a more one-to-one -one and personal experience. And that's, I think that's why modern audiobooks very rarely have music and sound effects in them, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know if no, you that, agree. Um, some of them I've heard with music and sound effects have been very good. I listened to um, uh, Romeo and Juliet which they use different actors for all of the different parts. Yes. And that had music, and that worked really well. That was like listening to a movie. Okay. But I do agree, some of the other ones, it's kind of distracting or too much, or if the voice is too low and the music is too high, it, it yeah. just, it, do, it yeah. doesn't work. It's also I, difficult I to get them to pass. I mean, I've done things where the people have wanted, bizarrely, some business books like to have the opening uh, statements and stuff with some kind of a music bed underneath it and it's it's actually quite difficult to do it and still meet the exacting ACX specifications for the audio because they like to have a, a noise floor with a certain number and sometimes the it's and it's done it's a computer an algorithm thing it'll hear the music in the background and think that's like background noise like traffic you know um and it'll knock it back and you, you, it really I've, the one the ones i've done that way have been a bit fiddly as well yeah okay i uh i found a video of you talking about uh radio and how what you do to get more people to call in as opposed to text oh yeah yeah that was an interesting yeah, thing that i really like that that was um that was at the Royal Institution in London, and they have a radio conference there every year called Next Radio. And that particular room is where people, old, like, you know, scientists, like, we're talking like, you know, Isaac Newton and Darwin and people, I mean, maybe not even that far back, but... Or, or, but they're like that is the room where these scientists proposed certain scientific theories through the years so it was a really it's a really old building it was really weird to be you know a bloke who spent 29 years making his living telling fart jokes to be actually speaking at an industry conference in a place like that was pretty bizarre for me but um yeah that was when i was at uh a bob fm um in the home counties uh yeah oh i'm glad i'm glad you watched that oh, so you've been stalking me too yeah absolutely uh, before i hired you and after <laughs> all right just to yeah. make sure i was genuine i could have put anything in my pitch couldn't i oh yeah i've been in radio and i won awards and i i'll see you like, let's just see if he really has yeah oh i see okay. I'm, uh, I'm fairly thorough uh yeah and I, I was wondering, it almost looked like a TED Talks kind of thing. So I was wondering where that was. Where that was yeah, it was that, it was that kind of a conference. It was a conference where you, you got to speak for either nine minutes or 18 minutes. And they asked me to speak and they said, would you like to speak for, for nine minutes or 18? And I went, I get to choose. And they went, yeah, I said, I'll do nine minutes. Thank you very much. And so I made my talk, uh, condensed it down to nine minutes with the audio clips from Australia and then the ones from the TV and stuff that I, that I put in there. And, uh, I think I packed it all in and nine packed a lot in, in the nine minutes that I was, 
uh, allotted, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun. I met some nice people there, and, and they, they were they were all British radio industry people. It was an industry uh, convention. Next Radio was the name of the conference, and uh, yeah, but it was just an honor to be speaking in that room. Yeah. Yeah, Next Media was the corporation that owned our stations back in the day. It's well, Next there's no Media. way, no way this was related to an American radio station owner, no. But uh, no, yeah. I don't think so. I think the the nine minutes was a good call. It's probably better to kind of keep it short and leave them wanting rather than drag it on the full eighteen to the point where people are like, "All right, how many minutes has this been?" I, I could have done eighteen, but there was some very hope high profile speakers they they fly them in from all over the world to speak at that you know and it's only london is only 30 miles down the road from me central london so um i i figured you know if i'm up against them if i i know i can hit them hard and i can do a tight nine but if you want an 18 it's probably not good i'm not gonna don't know whether i can do 18 of good stuff or like I, I know i can do nine and keep them uh interested and I could spread it to 18, but I don't know if, if some, you know, you only need a couple of dips in it and that's it. You're finished. You know what I mean? And it also yeah. comes back to, to working in radio, as you know, where, you know, if you're on a music format, you, you've, you're up against it. You can't waffle on for too long because you do, you do lose them and you've got to get back on and get the tunes playing again. Because that's why they tuned in to a music station is for the music. So, you right. know, you can, you can just only, one, uh, flick of the dial. one flick of the dial and they're gone. Yeah. Or, or a push button thing or or even worse you're still on but they've mentally tuned out that, that's got to be worse than them actually pushing the button it's like you're just yeah. droning away and they're not even listening yeah it's I interesting always... though because I, I didn't realize how drastic a decrease there was in people calling in that people were texting yeah when i first started in radio in australia it was just so i had i think there were 10 lines that flashed that we had and i was on from seven till midnight weeknights and there was pretty much never a time when all 10 lines weren't flashing you know people yeah. wanting to get through because that was the there was no email they couldn't email you they couldn't text you but now there are so many other ways to contact radio stations that that uh the guys on the air don't even answer the phone which is really tragic because the amount of great original content you get from the people on the phone is way better than anything a a bored jaded disc jockey can say, and it's it, and it's, it's much much better, more interesting, man, more unpredictable. That that is shocking because you know when I was a kid and in love with radio, I mean we would me and my one of my best friends we would spend hours just trying to get through to the station and just listening, and when they tell you to call in. And I remember the very first time we got on air, it was just nothing but two 12 year old girls screaming because we were on the radio. And yeah. I, uh, I remember yeah. my friends, my friend's dad storming into the room and he said, what's the matter? And we're like, we're on the radio. It was just so exciting. So it's, it is shocking to find out people are just texting. Cause I'm, I mostly listen to Pandora now. So right. I'm not too yeah. up on the radio scene anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I listen to podcasts these days. You know, I didn't. Uh, I can tell you that I turned the radio on once today, and it wasn't even a radio; it was Alexa. And I, I t told it to turn on the radio while I went out and picked up my wife from work because I wanted it to sound like there's somebody in the flat. So that's the only time I turned it on was to turn it on to not listen to it. I turned it on to then leave the flat. Yeah. Um, anything else, even in the car, I listen to podcasts. I listen to Bill Maher today. They do a podcast of his uh, real-time show. Um, that's the only thing I've listened to today. Mind you, I'm recording all day, so I don't get a chance to listen. I'm working on seven audio books at the moment. I always work on uh, on multiple books. I like to do a, a chapter or a couple of chapters of each and make sure I can switch and I have... Um, I have audio files of each when the new character arrives in a book. I I take out uh, a little clip of me doing that character for the the first line they say. If it's only a short line, I'm is the second line, so there's a good, good chunk there. So that when that character comes up again, I can go back and listen to how I did it to make sure I've I've got oh, yeah. it right. And I did that with yours. Um, sometimes with authors, um, there's an author who I work with. I've just done a second book with him, a children's book, uh, and there's lots of different, you know wild characters in kids books 
and I will send him just clips of the characters first, and he will approve them before I even start. I didn't do. Did I do that with you? I didn't do that with you, did I? Did I do them as we went? As the, uh, we went? You, you did not. No. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can do that with the next one if you want. If that's the way you want to go, it's just everybody works differently. But it's just yeah, you're the you're the boss. You call the shots, and uh, and that's the way it goes. Yeah. Yeah, it's good that you're that you're flexible. It makes you even more of a delight to work with. Oh, really? It was a delight to work with me. Whew, I have to steal Absolutely, that quote. Yeah. I have to steal that There's quote a... and put it in my profile on ACX. Delight to work with, says Larian. <laughs> no, no, that's just virtual. You know, I've not met you in person, so virtually, oh, okay, yes. Right. Yes, virtually. Yeah. I'm, I'm virtually delightful. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, no, that, that almost sounds like an insult virtually yes it does so I... yeah yeah that's what i mean yeah that's that's the that's the problem with the modern language not keeping up with the modern world isn't it okay so you've got two more of these at least two more of these to go and you've got other books you've got other work on as well that'll be coming out soon that people can look out for yeah i'm working on uh oh did i lose you no no i'm there i'm still there yeah, might have to edit that out that's okay. Um, yeah, I'm working on a novel. It's called Hope Falls. And yeah. it's kind of a Western romance. Still a work in progress. But it it's about this little town called Hope Falls in the middle of nowhere back in the early to mid-1800s. Yeah. And then a little girl goes missing, so the sheriff has to get involved. Right. So right. Well, hope, hoping good. to have that release. Yeah, hoping that'll be released in um, probably January, I hope. Right. So plenty going on for you. Yeah, a lot of writing. And uh, of... it was funny. My friend bought a copy of Freddy, and uh, and she sent me a picture, and she said, it's so small. And she said, but it's cute, though, because it's, it's the same size as Birdie, the paperback. That's okay. Nice. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah, I suppose it isn't that long. And in, in the, the audio book was only a few hours, wasn't it? A couple of hours. I think it was under two. I think it hit was it, it right at two? about an hour and 50 minutes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, so right. the, the next two parts, yeah, the next two parts will be probably the same length. So all three smushed together will be a novel. Yeah, you'll have to, once the, all three are together, you'll have to do the, they call it a bundle where you bundle the audio books together. I've done that for authors before when I've done a series of I've done a series of science fiction and a series of uh, romance, and we bundle them together and they sell them on Audible as a as a bundle, as a as a special deal, and they seem to sell really well. The feedback I get is when you, when you bundle them because I think most sales, most audiobook sales, are the people who have Audible memberships and they use their credits and they get one credit a month, so they think, hey, I can get three books for the one credit. Uh, yeah. whether, whatever their monthly fee is, like ten dollars or something, and I think, and I think that's why bundles do tend to go quite well. So that'll be something worth thinking about when the time comes. Yeah, I uh, checked out one of your recent um, publications. I think it was a romance that you recently yeah. Yeah. recently released, and that was like it was a bundle. And uh, I listened to the sample of that, and it sounded really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're they're easy to do. It's so easy to put the bundles together because I don't have to do any recording. I just have to edit them together. It's uh, and load load up each yeah. chapter, and uh, I I have to record uh, a um, opening and closing credits for the bundle, but the opening and closing credits for each individual book and and each chapter just run in order then. And the thing with the bundle is you get you, there's nothing you miss out on. It's not like they cut anything out to get them. It's everything that was in the the original books. Yeah, I think that was, was that the romance one was a series of about six books in the one bundle? Is that the one? I didn't look on Audible. Um, I, I checked it out on Amazon and okay. it had quite a few reviews, about at least a thousand reviews, but I, I think there were at least three parts to it. Yeah, yeah. And the yeah, sample yeah. that I listened to was really good. I can't remember yeah. the name of it. Yeah. Oh, well, it'll come back to you. Um the Strange Abduction of Freddy Heddy Hardcrumble. Where, the, where does the name, by the way, Freddy Heddy Hardcrumble, where does that come from? You know, I can't tell people the name of it without them saying what or laughing immediately. Uh, I, I do, I'm really big on names, so 
I go to the graveyard sometimes and I look at the headstones and I see interesting names, older names, and I'll write them down. Wow. Uh, or if I meet somebody and they just have an interesting first name or a name that sounds, I think hard crumble was something I made up. It, it might be someone's real last name, but I, I think I took it from two, two different places. Probably hard was part of a name and crumble was, I can't remember, but it's also kind of like Freddie because yeah. she's kind of hard. Yeah. But she also yeah, kind of yeah. crumbled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a great name for her. The Strange Abduction of Freddie Hedy Hardcrumble by Laurie Ann Polkin. It's available now as an ebook, as a paper book, as a, a whatever you call it, a traditional book, classic book, uh, and also as an audio book too. And I was, look, I was lucky enough to be selected as the narrator, and it is a lot of fun. Uh, well, I say it's a lot. It was a lot of fun to uh, record it's uh, it's a story that's that's on the dark side. Well, the the title is the strange abduction. What do you want? A fairy tale? Um, it is so, on the stranger side. Yeah, it is. It it is great. All the links to that and other Laurie Ann Poken stuff are in the description of you watching this on YouTube, and uh, check it out. Laurie it was uh, fabulous to meet you finally after we've worked together on this for so long. We we've got it out there, and uh, and thanks and continued success. Yes, you as well. You did a great job. It was really fun working on it with you.